Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Amen. While they're doing that, everybody online, we're so glad to have you there. Let us know who you are, where you are, what we're, where you're watching from, how we can pray for you. We're glad that you're there. Put it in the chat and let us know that you're there with us this morning. Hallelujah. Woo! Some days you walk in the building knowing that there's something about to happen. This is one of those days. I had, we got Pat Ratcliffe on the front row. I knew something was going to happen when Patricia walked in here. One of my oldest friends. Good to have you here, Pat. We welcome everybody today. Today, if you wandered in, is a special day. This is an anniversary Sunday for us, and, and we don't just cut cake and have fun and all that kind of stuff, but I feel like God has something that I'm supposed to deliver this morning. I, I came with something in my heart. We're going to, uh, I'm going to enjoy today. I've got a few things that I want to, to say. If you've joined us along the way of the last 39 years in this journey to bring us to today, uh, I'm hoping that today we'll maybe answer some of those questions about who, what, when, where, how, and why. How did we get here and who we are and all of that. Uh, but at the same time, who we want to be and where we're going. Uh, it is going to be a word from heaven this morning that's just going to drop in this place. We're going to uh, give that word and then I'm going to have Jared come up and say a few words and then we're going to pray. We're going to conclude with prayer over Jared and Kelsey this morning and, and then we're going to go outside and have some, some time of fellowship. So you came on a good day. Isn't that always good to know? You came on a good day, so it's good, it's good to be in the house. If you have your Bible open with me to Matthew chapter 9, and if we would, as always, I know you've been standing for a few minutes, would you stand in honor of the reading of God's Word this morning, giving honor and respect to His Word this morning. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35, the first word, then, stop there, what is then? Then is an indication that there is something that has been happening before this. Anytime you read your Bible and a sentence starts with the word then, you might want to take a minute and back up. What you do, you read it in context. Jesus was at this moment doing the work of the kingdom from verse 1 down through verse 35. You watch him immersed in it, signs, wonders, miracles, healing, deliverance, the work of the kingdom of God. He was doing it all and it was just natural to him, naturally supernatural. Verse 35, then... Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd concept of a shepherd has been all but lost in the 21st century, especially in the 21st century church. I don't know if we even recognize or understand or know what a pastor is anymore. We, we think he's the talking head at the front of the room. This is the least of the work that I do. The shepherd is so important in your life. You need to have a shepherd watching over, praying, participating in your life. He said that he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest, redirecting your attention again to verse 36. He was moved with compassion for them. Now, the translations say it in different ways, but this is one of my favorite. He was moved with compassion for them. This morning uh, on our 39th anniversary, I want to talk with you about being bothered. Some of you are already well ahead of the curve. You're already bothered that you're standing up again. God have mercy. I want to talk with you this morning about being bothered. My goal in this sermon is to bother you. If you walk out of here this morning saying, I'm not eating his hot dogs, I ain't eating his hamburgers, he made me mad. I've done my job. But you know what? I'm going to go back next Sunday and see if he straightens it out. Next Sunday will be worse. I want to talk to you about being bothered. Father, give us a word this morning in due season. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We thank you for it. And they said together, amen. amen. Please be seated. Not long ago, I was having one of those days where I just wanted to turn my brain completely off. I don't know if y'all have a brain like that, but... <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It just runs. 
And I just had one of those days where I'm like, I got to turn this thing off. <laughs> Kathy was working. Translation, I had the remote control to myself. <laughs> so I was operating in, in my best manhood. I was gleefully scrolling through the titles of Netflix, just looking for anything, just looking for something to look at. And somewhere along the way, I found a documentary on internet trolls and hackers and scammers and people who do almost nothing but live online all of their lives. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Internet trolls and hackers and scammers and just people you're, you, in your head, you're already drawing in it. He's talking about Bill. You, it's somebody that you know that, that does that. And so I flipped it on. And at first, it was mildly interesting. They were talking about what they do and, and all of that. And I don't know if you know this or not, but that's a whole world. That, that, that really is. It's its own universe. It's, don't go there. It's just a whole world where trolling and hacking is, is all out there. And there are people starting arguments and disrupting things. There are people that are, they live on the internet for nothing else but to just argue and to dis, disrupt you, to try to steal your identity and, and all of that. And it was, at first it was interesting, but about 15 minutes into it, y'all know me, my ADD kicked in and I'm like... Butterfly, I got to go find something else to look at. And just when I was about to turn the channel, I was getting ready to switch when the person on the documentary did a deep dive. And they, they started to ask the persons, the people, all of them, why? I'm a person who loves to understand motivation. Motivation is important to me because whatever a person does, the motivations mean everything. So when they, when they started saying to these people, you know, how did you get here? Why are you like this? Why do you do that? Why are you in this position that you are? It was interesting to me because it was different cities, states, nations, cultures, languages, rich, poor, young, old. There were people who came from extreme poverty and there were people who came from extreme privilege on the other end. Literally, every, every spectrum, rich, poor, young, old, black, white, all, all of it, you would think that their responses would be completely different. That with that wide of a spectrum, that there would at least be some differentiality in that. But they all started saying the exact same things. It was fascinating. When I was a child, I was left alone. My mother and father were always at work. They were always at work. I was always alone. I grew up as a loner. I didn't ever have friends. I didn't have a bunch of friends, and I didn't, I didn't want any. I, I went to school. I came home from school. I locked myself in my room, and I went to this world. I went to the Internet as I did, whether it was to game sites or chat rooms or videos or porn or dark web or music, whatever it was, because, listen to this, they said, I wanted to be alone without being alone. In this place, I found out, they said, that I could be with people without being with people. I could actually be with people without involving and engaging. In cyberspace, I had friends, quote unquote, but I could be whoever and whatever I wanted to be at any time. With the click of a mouse, I could change the icon. I could become something else. With the click of a mouse, I could change the name. I could become someone else. In this room, I would be this person. In that room, I would be someone else. In these games, I could do all of this stuff all by myself. I could be alone without being... Are you following me? Yeah. Now, without actually labeling anyone <laughs> or aging anyone, there are actually some of us ancient beings... Dinosaurs, as it were, that can actually remember what the world was like before the internet. Yeah. See a few old heads nodding in the room, like, don't hurt yourself. Don't, don't hurt yourself. <laughs> April the 30th, 1993, the internet hit the public market. It hit the world. And I remember when it came out, and we were all like, ooh, right. <laughs> this is it, man. Come on. This is, this is it. What, what we didn't know was we were right. This is it. We, we didn't even realize what we didn't see then, but what we can clearly see now is that we created a culture of isolation. 
There is an element to connection to it, and I get it. But now, if you look deeper, we are, we are creating. We have created and we are continuing to create a culture of isolation where human interaction and contact are now being seen as bothersome by a lot of people. They don't want to live in the quote-unquote meat world. They want to live in the cyber world, and they are vastly quickly disappearing into it. It has become easier and easier over time to do this. Do you remember when the Sony Walkmans came out? We had the little round thing on your hip, right? You couldn't jog because it would shake the CD and you were like... So you were trying to work out, but you couldn't. And you had the earpieces in and everybody knew that when you had those earpieces in, that meant leave me alone. I got the... I don't want to be bothered, but... But now there are, listen, uh, you know this, there are thousands of videos on YouTube with people now with these new things, these goggles. Goggles that they're wearing. And these goggles, you, they're, 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 you see them on planes and trains and buses and, and all over the place wearing these goggles because with these goggles on, they don't have to have anything to do with anybody. It used to be that I just had my earbuds in and I could still see you, but now we're wearing goggles so nobody can see anybody in this documentary. They said, listen to this carefully, I'm building a bridge here. They said, we want to be left alone. And so now what we have, right now, is an entire generation of people who are socially awkward. I'll take it further. We are socially disabled. A generation of people who don't even know how to carry on a conversation. The seemingly simple art of conversation eludes them. They cannot have a conversation. It, it makes them uncomfortable and awkward. And one of the last things that they said in this documentary was this. They said, I stay away from everyone because I don't want to be bothered. And when they said that, that little God bell in me rang loud, y'all. It rang loud. And I said, there's a word there. I escape into this person in this place because I don't want to be bothered. Instantly, I remembered two things that happened, that happened to me. The first was probably 15 or 20 years ago. Kathy and I were, were walking downtown on St. George Street. We love on Sunday nights, we love nothing more than to go downtown and just park somewhere and just walk the streets of our city. What a beautiful city. And it happened on that night that we were walking around. And on this particular night, there were homeless people everywhere. Just, just everywhere. We know this. That they're, they're always here. They're always a part of our fabric in our community. They're always here. But this was 15 or 20 years ago. And at that time, it just seemed like there was, it was a lot more at this, this moment where we were. Like every place, they were on every, like every corner. It was odd. It was just an odd night. And in one place, there was this one person in particular that was either passed out or sleeping or something on the ground. And because of where he was, where he was laying, people were literally having to step over him to, to continue on with their walking where they were going. I mean, listen. <laughs> this is a per <laughs> It messes me up. This is a person. And they're stepping over this person like it's an animal or, or a piece of trash on the sidewalk. And I remember, I, I remember, I, I got away from that and I looked back and I said, this is messed up. There's something wrong. With, there's something wrong with our culture. When we can step over a person and then look back at them with disdain, like, get out of this, get out of the way. You're in the way. It bothered me. I remembered that. The second thing that I recalled just, just that fast was a post that my daughter-in-law, Kelsey, had put on Facebook just a, a few months ago. It affected me so deeply, I, I wrote it down and I said, I don't know what God is saying, but I'm, I'm going to be coming back to this, I'm sure, and I did. It was about a day when she was somewhere doing something and wherever she was, she happened to see a homeless person going into a dumpster looking for food. You know how that is. Obvious, it was obvious that they were not hunting trash, they were hunting food. And so it just, she made this amazing post about being bothered by that. That it, that it bothered her so deeply that they went, I'm stealing their blessing. They went and got the guy some food and brought it back. 
end of story. Today is a commemoration. Today is a, a recognition. I thought about today a lot. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm, old people, help me. I'm thinking about days a lot more. My daddy once told me, he said, there comes a time in your life when you realize you got more days behind you than ahead of you. And that way, every day is a better day. You, you, <laughs> you really hang out in that day. You really want to be there in that day. And I've been thinking about us as a church and what we were going to do today and about where we've been and where we are and where we're going and, and what, I, what that needs to look like, what that really needs to look like going forward. Today, listen, this, this is interesting, is the exact anniversary of our church. 39 years ago today, April the 21st, 1985, seven people met over at our little rented building on South Whitney Street. Our rent was $400 a month, and I was freaking out. We ain't got no people. <laughs> I know my parents were looking at me like, you better do something, boy. That day, I, I call, recall it as clear as a crystal goblet. We had nothing. Nothing. We had no members, no money, no mission statement, no plan, not at all. Churches these days start out with a plan like a franchise from McDonald's. Man, they've got it all mapped out and ready to go. I was like, hey, let's do this. We had no equipment, we had no music, no musicians, no teachers, no identity. We didn't even know who we were. I didn't know who I was. I was just an ex-cop trying to do something. For a while, we were, a, here's the walk down the history, we were a traditional church. If you would have walked in the doors at South Whitney Street those years, it would have been a traditional church. We had to borrow redback hymnals from a friend of mine so we would have something to sing from. We didn't even, own, it didn't even own those, and we just took off and, and did, God blessed, and, and it, the church started doing well. We bought land over on, you'll hear us refer to Kings Estates Road. In 1988, three years later from the day we started, we had bought and built land, built over there, and we had become a different kind of a church. Some of you, if, if, if you were there, chime in with me here at some point, so I'll remember where you joined us. But we were, at the time, always pushing envelopes. We were trying stuff different. I, I didn't know what we wanted to be, but I, I didn't want to be like everybody else because it seemed weird to just look like everybody else. So we were always trying new different things. And, and after a while, they stopped calling us Family Worship Center, and they started calling us Family Entertainment Center. Mm, I won't use the P word in church, but it ticked me off. It made me mad. It affected me. Oh, you go to Family Entertainment Center. And, uh, still makes me mad. I didn't think it affected me, but it did, because if you were there, you remember that we, we soon became known as the church for people that don't like church. That became, we put it, we had billboards, we put it on billboards. If you don't like church, if you've been judged, if you've been criticized, this church is for everybody, but it's not for everybody. 2001, I had a radical change in my life. I'll never forget the day that I took all of the suits out of my closet. I had some suits, y'all. Mm. Remember that? Took all my suits out of my closet. Took them to Goodwill. And I walked into Goodwill and I laid them all up on the counter of Goodwill. The lady said, what do you want to do? I said, I don't care. These are all yours. Sell them. I don't care. I threw away all my suits. I gave them all away and I said out loud to this community, if you have been hurt, if you have been judged, if you've been criticized, if you've been condemned, come here. Come here. We will meet you where you're at. We will love you like you are. And we will help you take your next step, no matter what that step is. We will love you just like you are. Yeah, y'all cheer, but you know what happens when you get a building full of hurting people? They start doing what comes natural. They start fighting one another. That's the truth. So... We went on down the road a little bit, and eventually we became the motorcycle church. <laughs> I've always ridden a motorcycle, so we, start, we had a motorcycle ministry, and we started bringing bikers in here. And y'all remember the events. We had Harleys on stage all out front here. Man, we played rock and roll music. It was amazing. <sighs> I miss that. 
the only reason we quit doing it is because one day I was somewhere and I was introduced to somebody and she said, oh, you're the biker church. And I was like, mm, not really. No, we're just a church that loves, so we had to change it. Today is our, our 39th anniversary. And it has taken us 39 years to become who we are now. And who we are now is for me, and I'll say this boldly and proudly, who we are now is the most biblical church we have ever been in the history of this ministry today. In Matthew chapter 25, at the judgments of the nations, in verse 31, if you don't know where this is, you need to know where this is. The Bible says that when the Son of Man will come in all of His glory with all of the holy angels with Him, He will divide the nations before Him as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. He will put the sheep on His right, He will put the goats on His left, and He will say to the sheep, verse 35, verse 35, I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and in prison, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. When you look at this church... Whether you're this close or you're 30,000 feet in the air, if you're across town or if you're online, what, when you look at this church, that is the blueprint that we do. Why is this church like we are? Matthew chapter 25. That is why we are like we are. Our food pantry since 2014 has served over 3 million meals to this community just through the food pantry. Every week. Every week, between 20 and 40,000 pounds of food goes out to this community because I, like many of you, cannot stand the thought that there'll be a child laying in bed at night with something not in their kitchen to eat. I can't think about a child going to bed hungry. So our food pantry, it does a lot of things for this community. It does cost us a lot, but it's worth everything that we put into it. Amen. Acts chapter 29. Acts chapter 29. Building wheelchair ramps and repairing people's houses, putting porches on their houses, repairing their roofs, putting in new floors in their houses. Because in this county, there is no mechanism in place for people that need something like that. The waiting list was two and three years long. Carol and Randy Dickerson have put this ministry together. And over the last five years, they have built so many wheelchair ramps and put people back inside of their houses. It matters. This church, 4S. Soup, showers, sandwiches, salvation, and now I missed something. Sweaters, socks, <laughs> something else. It's a bunch of S's going on. Dealing with the homeless in our community, taking care of the homeless here, making hygiene kits, making food available, making the clothes available, the shoes available. When you go to Dining with Dignity, one of the ministries that, that Jim and Kathy run through this church, help through this church, downtown feeding people, taking care of them, not just serving them, but giving them dignity when they get a meal and lunch for the next day. We are practicing exactly what Jesus said and what he did. Why is this church like this? That's why. I've always loved this story, Matthew 9. In Matthew 9, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Jesus didn't just talk about it. He did it. There are too many churches in our world that are talking about it and not doing it. Verse 36 is critical. Verse 36, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. That verse became reality to me years and years ago. He was moved with compassion for them. Verse, and that translation in another Bible says, when he saw the crowds, he felt sorry for them. They were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. As I transition into the role that I think is going to be my last role here, as we move closer, to the day that I'm going to hand the reins over to the next leaders. As we move closer and closer to that day, the young leaders that are going to take this thing, and there's a bunch of young leaders in this place that are like Mustangs chewing on their bridles, ready to take and run. Cool your jets. <laughs> I'm thinking, what do we want this church to look like moving forward? What do we want this church to look like moving forward. And everything in me says, I want it to look exactly like that. I want our church to be bothered 
and never stop being bothered. I don't care if anybody else does it or not. I want our church to be bothered and never stop being bothered. When I read this story, I see the church that I would love for us to be and the church that I want us to become. On this 39th anniversary, I want us to be bothered. I want us to be bothered, y'all, that people are lost. That last command should always be our first priority. But sometimes in the church, we forget what it means to be evangelistic minded and reach to the lost and engage them in a discussion about the salvation of their soul. I want us to be bothered that people are lost and hungry and sick and broken. I want us to be bothered that men are being told that masculinity is toxic. And women are being told in this culture, you don't need a man. And in that void, in the void of men being men and women in their godly roles, homosexuality and lesbianism becomes the acceptable alternative and no one has the courage to oppose it. Oh, y'all going to get quiet on me. I told you I was going to bother you. No one, no one, I, I want us to be bothered. I want us to be bothered that marriage is on the decline. We don't think about that, but it is bothersome. This is God's original design. A man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. It is not, let us just test the waters and live together for a while and see. Marriage is on the decline. God says we need to bring that back. I want us. I want us to be bothered. That sin and Satan in our ungodly culture is targeting and indoctrinating children and moving them further and further away from God every single day. I want us to be bothered that because of that, more and more of them are choosing lives and careers that are all about fame, money, and power rather than a serious consideration that maybe I could give my life to the kingdom of God. Maybe I could be a missionary, an evangelist, a pastor, or a teacher to serve God in the world somehow. You don't have to be rich and famous. You just need to have a willing heart to serve God. I want us to be bothered. I want us to be bothered. That we don't pray anymore in schools. Oh, well, it's been that way for so long. That's just how it is. Why? And why does it have to stay like that? If that's the way that it is, if we let it stay like that, it's just because you don't want to be bothered to make the effort to change that. Y'all buckle up. I'm I'm, I'm feeling it, y'all. I didn't mean to, but if you brought a guest with you this morning, I apologize in advance. I want us to be bothered that abortion on demand is the law of the land. That pornography is destroying the sexuality of our culture. Because it is. I want us to be bothered that substance abuse and alcohol abuse is accepted. While deliverance is shunned and considered by the church to just be too radical. I am. We, we, we say who the sun sets free is free indeed, but then we have drug addicts and alcoholics come to church and we don't want to lay hands on them and pray a prayer of deliverance over them that God would deliver them from it. We want to recommend them to go somewhere. We want to recommend that you go somewhere and talk to somebody. Well, they came to church to talk to Jesus, so talk to Jesus and believe that God can break those chains and set them free. Deliverance needs to come back into the house of God. I want our church to look like that. That people will walk in the door just as messed up as they've ever been in their lives. And when they walk out, they will walk out free. Free in Jesus' name. I want us. I want us to be bothered. Help me, God. I want us to be bothered. That the best people, oh God, that the best people avoid politics. Even though the Bible clearly says that when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people mourn. And so what happens is that the best people don't run. They stay back and they don't put their hand in it because they don't want, pardon my But they don't want the hell that comes with it when you step into that arena. I want to speak to this church, and this might be my last sermon, but it's going to be a good one. That 
when you vote in November, don't you dare step into that booth and vote R or D for Republican or Democrat. I will haunt you for the rest of your life. When you step into that booth, you better vote a B or a U, a believer or an unbeliever. And either one, it doesn't matter. They need to be on the same. Don't they say another. I want it. Are y'all with me? Because I'm going to get some mail on this one. I want us to be bothered enough to get up off of our blessed assurance, abandon ourselves to God, take up your cross, and follow him. Good God Almighty, get off the fence. I'm trying to help you. Get everybody mad at me. Y'all are like him. I want us to be bothered that the church of the 21st century is as weak and sinful and powerless as it is. Bowing as much as it does to the culture that it was called to reach. What in God's name are we doing bowing to this culture? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would slap us when we walked into heaven. Why are you bowing to this culture? In our current climate, preachers are tripping all over themselves trying to be famous. I want to be famous or get a picture with someone who is. You moron. Get off the red carpet and get back in the prayer closet where you need to be. And reach heaven in prayer and let God... I don't need to know famous people. I know Jesus. They need to know Jesus. So when they meet me, they should walk away knowing Jesus. I want us to be bothered that too many times, and you know I'm telling you the truth, that people in the church are listening more for gossip than gospel. I'll wait, you gossiping bunch of hardheads. Too many times, people in the church are listening more for gossip than gospel. I'm preaching now. I can tell by the look on your face. You're like, I ain't afraid of none of y'all. You know what I heard? Anybody starts a sentence like that, you need to slap them. Because nothing following that's going to be good. Especially if they do this. You know what I heard? You know what I heard? You know what I heard? I heard Jesus loves them. That's what I heard. I heard. I heard. I heard God hates people that sow discord among the brethren. That's what I heard. I heard you just about get struck with hemorrhoids. You keep that up. Because I... I pray like that. I got letters years ago. Anyway, never mind. I'm almost done. I literally could do this all day, though. We should be bothered that we spend in the church too much time polishing our armor and then fighting one another. We know we're supposed to be fighting. We just forget who we're supposed to be fighting. So in the absence of a clear enemy, you'll do. (laughs) Preacher, he'll do. Let me get some of that. You don't want none of that. We fight one another when (laughs) our weapons are not carnal. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Your battle is not with other people or other churches or other believers. Your battle is with those spirits that work in that place. We should be bothered that the Holy Spirit is not as active in our churches today as he was in the first century. Where they walked out of those buildings saying, we have seen strange things today. Sometimes we put a lid on the Holy Ghost because we don't want all that. We don't want all that tongues and all that hand laying and all that stuff. We put a lid on him. That's the most foolish thing we could do. You put a lid on a fire, the fire goes out. We should be bothered that the Holy Spirit is not as active in our churches today as he needs to be. We don't need to be professional and presentable. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in this place. We need the power of God. The power of God that can set people free. I can do this all day. I want this church in closing. Deep in my heart, I want this church to care more about people 
than crowds. Matthew chapter 15, if you have your Bible. Matthew chapter 15, I don't know if they have this on the screens or not. I, I wish they did. But. Then Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They have been with me these three days and they have nothing left to eat. I don't want to send them away hungry or they will faint along the way. Verse 33, the disciples replied, Listen to the disciples. Where would we get enough food here in the wilderness for such a huge crowd? Jesus said, how much bread do you have? He said, seven loaves and a few small fish. Verse 35, so Jesus told all the people, sit down on the ground. The disciples saw a crowd. Jesus saw people. It's so easy to get lost in that. It's so easy to get lost in, let's get a crowd. Oh, we had a great crowd. You don't need a great crowd. You need people. As your pastor, when I stand up here, I don't see a crowd. I see people. And I want this church moving forward. They're going to build something amazing. Young people, going to build something amazing. There's going to be crowds and there's going to be mega crowds and all that goes along. Multitudes are going to, but don't ever forget, it's not about the crowds. It's about the people. If you'd bow your head with me this morning, I want us this morning to be bothered. I want us to be bothered. That phrase alone flies into the face of our culture because we are developing a culture these days of people that do not want to be bothered. They want to be left alone. They want to do the bare minimum. They don't like to be inconvenienced. If something takes longer than 30 seconds, I don't want to wait. If something is going to cost me time or money or inconvenience, I don't want to do that. You see, just talking about hungry people is one thing. But showing up Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and putting those boxes together and feeding thousands of people every week takes time, it takes effort. It's easy to talk about helping homeless people. Oh, somebody needs to help the homeless people. But it takes time when people sacrifice parts of their life to show up and, and be there and pack those bags and do that work. It takes time. I want us as a church to be bothered. Now and moving forward. This is our 39th anniversary, and I've said we've spent 39 years trying to build a church that if we were to close, this community would mourn. Because they would miss the work that we do. Kathy and I were talking about this just yesterday. Going to church is fun. Being in this room with one another is fun. But for us, what this church does this church does is the work. <sighs> I'm so proud of you. a father to his children. I'm so proud of you. Someone this last week was talking about our church to one of our members. 
my name came up and they said, oh yeah, he's that guy that feeds all those people. And this person quickly said, no, he's not. It's the people in the church that feed all those people, that do all that work. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of the work that we do and the church that we are and the church that we have become. And I'm so excited about the church that we are going to be moving forward. With heads bowed and hearts open this morning, if you would just bow your heads with me, please. This is a heavy sermon. It's a heavy word. But it speaks to the very core of who we are as a church. I cannot be, we cannot be a church that just takes up space on a corner. We cannot be a church that just has church on Sundays and calls that good enough. We cannot be that church. I would rather be called on and go to heaven rather than pastor that church. We cannot be a church that people are just known for infighting with one another. That's all they do. They just fuss and fight. We cannot just be a church that is known for an identity of some kind. Their music or their whatever they do. I want this church to be recognized as a church that's not afraid to be bothered. It's a matter of fact, it's a part of their identity. That's who we are. We're bothered enough to give. We're bothered enough to work. We're bothered enough to serve and show up. We're bothered enough to be inconvenienced because it matters. Because according to Matthew chapter 25, one day we're going to stand there and he's going to say, I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was in prison, you came to me. You weren't ashamed to be called my friend. That's who we are. With heads bowed and hearts open, I'm asking this church to pray, God, bother me. Let us be a church that is not afraid to be bothered. Let us be bothered enough to reach the lost. Let us be bothered enough to go the extra mile. Let us be bothered enough to serve. Let us be bothered. What a blessing. What a blessing and an honor it is to be called your pastor. This morning, I want us to pray individually and collectively. Maybe what God is speaking into your life right now is that it's been a while since you've been bothered. And now you're bothered. And now you're bothered. Mission accomplished. How can I serve? What can I do? How can I better live my life? What can I do? Surrender. Surrender. In a minute, I'm going to just give them an opportunity. Girls, y'all come and sing. Just lift your voice and, and just a single song. And we've got plenty of time. But maybe somebody in here is searching for your purpose in life. God, I surrender. Maybe that's, you're the person I just spoke about who needs a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're the prodigal son or daughter and you're not walking with him right now as you have. When we give the invitation for prayer, you're the most important thing, the most important person in this building. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. So this morning, if there's anybody in here that just said, Lord, I need to surrender my life to you today. For the first time, or maybe just need to return home. Father, today's that day. Maybe there are some servants in the building already and you're serving God with all you've got. And maybe you're a little tired. Now's a good day to pray for a refreshing and a renewal. That God would stir that fire up on the inside of you. There's probably one or two old-fashioned people in here that wouldn't mind laying hands on you and praying that God would stir you up for the work. Believing that God will. Maybe you walked in the building this morning and you've got an addiction of some kind. And you want to walk out free. There's one or two old-fashioned people in here that will anoint you and pray for you and believe God to break every chain break every chain off of your life. Today is a good day. You wouldn't mind, let's stand together across the building. In a moment, we're going to give an invitation for prayer. We want you to come and pray. And then in just a few moments after that, we're going to want to hear a couple of words from you. And then we're going to pray for you guys. Wish I had a keyboard player, Kathy. All to Jesus I surrender. 
All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.